The National Psoriasis Foundation is a leading national nonprofit organization supporting research on psoriasis and the associated comorbidities, including psoriatic arthritis, offering patient and provider education and advocating for the needs of the psoriatic disease community. NPF has been providing educational programs to early career healthcare professionals for more than 20 years. Our annual residence meeting, our mentor program, and our research programs all share the goal to increase the number of clinician scientists focused on studying and treating psoriatic disease and related conditions. By providing this program to medical schools, our goal is to raise awareness of psoriatic disease for early career healthcare professionals. Whether you go on to practice dermatology, rheumatology, primary care, or any other specialty, we hope this program will provide you with an introduction to the pathophysiology, clinical presentation, burden of disease, screening, diagnosis, and treatment options for psoriatic disease and the related comorbidities. The immunopathogenesis of psoriasis is complex. It involves an interplay between the immune system, genes, and several environmental factors. In the normal appearing skin of individuals with psoriasis, the activation of dendritic cells by unknown stimuli is one of the earliest immune events triggering the development of a psoriasis plaque. Activated dendritic cells secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interferon and tumor necrosis factor, or TNF, which stimulate other dendritic cells to produce interleukin-23, or IL-23. Increased amounts of TNF and IL-23 activate resident T-cells in the skin to expand and produce high levels of IL-17A and IL-17F, as well as other inflammatory cytokines like TNF and IL-22. IL-23 sustains the IL-17-producing cells in the skin, which are primarily responsible for the clinical features of psoriasis. In response to these early inflammatory signals, the keratinocytes become activated, begin to hyperproliferate, and then produce additional cytokines and proteins, such as antimicrobial peptides, IL-17C, IL-19, and IL-36. These keratinocyte-derived products result in the recruitment of additional immune cells, including T-cells, dendritic cells, and neutrophils. This creates a self-amplifying or positive feed-forward inflammatory response that is responsible for the mature chronic psoriatic plaque. The inflammatory response in patients with psoriasis is not limited to the skin. Rather, psoriasis is associated with systemic inflammation and the development of other comorbid diseases, including psoriatic arthritis, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, mental illness, and inflammatory bowel disease. Through the development of highly effective targeted therapies that disrupt the IL-23, IL-17 signaling axis, healthcare providers are better equipped to treat psoriasis and potentially negate the detrimental effects of this disease. I'm going to be speaking to you about the basics of psoriasis. I'm Abby Van Voorhees, uh, and I'm the Chair of Dermatology at Eastern Virginia Medical School. So psoriasis is a chronic immune-mediated disease, which affects approximately 2 to 3 percent of the entire U.S. population. We know now that this is a genetic disease, which is triggered by environmental factors. It's probably the oldest recorded cutaneous disease uh, known to man. Likely it was first described in 460 B.C. And originally it was thought to be a variant of leprosy, so much of what you may read about, um, it, for those of you who've ever read the Bible, um, when you read about uh, cases of leprosy, probably many of those patients really had psoriasis. But the consequences was equally severe because uh, having this diagnosis resulted in patients being ostracized from their communities, which in the olden days was really tantamount to, uh, to death. As I said earlier, it affects about 2 to 3 percent of the U.S. population. In the United States, Caucasians are, um, have a higher frequency than African Americans, and they have a higher frequency than Hispanics. There's a very low incidence of psoriasis in Native Americans and uh, the Inuit uh, and Yupik peoples. Um, 
The highest risk uh, from around the globe is thought to occur in, in those of Scandinavian background. And this makes sense because, you know, we, um, for much of time, uh, people were isolated to their areas. And so, um, and that gen those genetic codes got more inbred. And so it makes sense that, they, w that we see these genetic variations even today uh, with our more mixed uh, ethnicities now. Um, interestingly, uh, you're probably not surprised that the incidence of African Americans uh, in our country is the same incidence as um, as in Africa on that Western uh, Horn. So, um, and this is where many African Americans originally derive from. In contrast. In Africa, on the eastern side of the continent, the incidence is actually a little bit higher. It's about two to three percent. So we're talking about inheritance of psoriasis, and a third of patients actually have a known family history of psoriasis. They'll tell you that their grandmother or their father or their mother had psoriasis, and they're aware of it. We find that about Another third of patients often eventually find out that there is a more distant family member or a family member who had been just, you know, quiet about having psoriasis. Um, so that in total, eventually about two thirds of people find out that somebody in their family also had this disease. A third of the time we believe that these are new genetic uh, mutations. But I think what's very clear is that for those who do have a genetic tendency, um, we, you know, we see a higher incidence of psoriasis. So, for example, if a relative has psoriasis, there's a higher incidence of somebody in that family developing psoriasis. If a, if a child, um, you know, in, in children of affected parents, we see a higher incidence as well. And, and most strongly, we see this uh, with twins, where, um, where when you have identical twins or monozygotic twins, um, if one twin is affected, then there's a 70% likelihood of the second. Um, but dizygotic twins, um, that's only about a quarter. And so you can see that there's a role of inheritance, but there's also a role of environmental factors accounting for why monozygotic twins don't come close to 100%. At this point, we've identified about 80 susceptibility genes. Um, they're mostly called the SORS genes, um, and, uh, and we've identified 1 to 15, but this is probably just the beginning. Um, and, you know, of these genes, there's probably some specificity for a different ethnicity and different races. Um, but I think this will be the beginning of precision medicine. So I, 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 I anticipate that we will have many more genes identified by the time we really characterize psoriasis completely. So I said earlier that this is a genetic disease that's often triggered by environmental factors. And those triggers can be very broad, but, and patients have very strong feelings about it. So for example, for many patients, stress um, is a trigger. Um, and you know, who amongst us doesn't have some stress? So you can see where this is a common problem. Infections for others uh, can often be triggers. Um, sometimes strep throats, for example, can trigger uh, psoriasis. We'll talk about this kind in just a few moments, a gut type of psoriasis. Um, in children, sometimes perianal uh, strep infections can trigger psoriasis. HIV disease, for example. Um, Many people believe that alcohol and smoking trigger psoriasis, and we see that in some of the nursing health studies where uh, smokers and uh, those who have more substantial alcohol abuse have a higher rate of psoriasis. Um, trauma can, um, we'll learn about that in a few moments, and, and also medications certainly are known to be uh, triggers of psoriasis. The most common age that psoriasis starts is in young people. It's in people in their 20s and 30s. Um, there's a second peak in the middle age years, people in their 50s and 60s. Um, but psoriasis can also appear in, in childhood. And here, the mean age for onset is about age eight. And about 1% of psoriasis begins in childhood, uh, that or at least is firmly diagnosed in childhood. Males and females are affected equally, um, but there are unique issues for our women patients. Um, partially it's because, as we talked about earlier, it's a disease that starts in most people when they're fairly young. 
And so many of our women um, are not yet of childbearing age or are just coming into their childbearing age. And, um, and this creates unique issues for them um, should they want to get pregnant. Um, psoriasis actually frequently improves spontaneously during pregnancy, um, but, uh, but it also can then flare very substantially after the pregnancy is, is completed. So, um, so certainly this creates definite issues for our, our female patients. So why, what bothers uh, patients about psoriasis? I mean, I think this list is just touches the surface, but patients who have psoriasis, they complain that their skin is itchy all the time, that it's scaly. I've had patients tell me that as, when they get out of their bed in the morning, they have to vacuum their bed. Um, it's, the skin is red, and so it's, it's unsightly, it's painful, it burns. Um, it often is malodorous, and it can bleed. Uh, patients will talk about the fact that, that it makes them feel self-conscious, that they feel unattractive. And it takes a huge amount of time um, just to do the treatments that sometimes are required, to attend the healthcare appointments. Um, and then, as I said, you know, trying to keep up with keeping things clean uh, as a result of the burden of skin disease is huge. In fact, when you ask patients to compare how their psoriasis makes them feel to other chronic diseases, psoriasis in particular scores badly. So there's a, a quality of life survey uh, called the SF36, and um, getting closer to red is bad. Um, and you can see physically um, psoriasis scored really only um, second to how bad congestive heart failure makes people feel. It's worse, for example, than having a heart attack. It's worse than depression, all these other things. Really, uh, psoriasis takes its toll physically. And you see the same thing mentally, uh, where psoriasis, again, is close to that red, you know, really only being edged out by depression. So certainly our patients suffer hugely as a result of this disease burden. Um, and you know, it probably doesn't surprise you that not only does it affect our patients, but it affects their ability to have you know, good, good healthy family and social interactions as they're busy trying to hide their disease from others and you know, feel uncomfortable about being intimate and sleep poorly and really don't engage well. So let's talk about the different kinds of psoriasis. There are five different kinds of psoriasis and they're listed here on your slide. There's plaque psoriasis, that's the most common and we're gonna go through each of these in just a moment. There's guttate psoriasis, which um, there's something called intratriginous psoriasis, pustular psoriasis, and erythrodermic psoriasis. And this is pictures of all of these different kinds and you can see how varied they are. Um, from over here on the right where you have um, a large plaque of psoriasis, a part of plaque psoriasis, to involvement on somebody's feet, to involvement of the fingernails. Um, you see the terribly deforming psoriatic arthritis that sometimes can occur, involvement of the genitalia. You can see that the presentation is, broad, you know, is quite broad. But what makes this a unified diagnosis is the very classic lesion. So let's just talk about what features we're looking for in a lesion of psoriasis. So first of all, we're looking that it should be an erythematous plaque. Um, remember, an elevated red, uh, red lesion. I think of that as like a red mesa uh, sitting on the skin. Um, it's very distinctive. In other words, it stops and starts very clearly. So you see normal skin right here and, involve, and very involved skin just a few millimeters over. And there's this overlying silvery scale. So we'll see that in all the variations just slightly with slightly different presentations. So 80% of patients have what we call chronic plaque psoriasis, those discrete lesions that we were just describing. Often they're symmetric, so in other words, if you have lesions on, your, on one elbow, you'll have a matching one on the other, um, or similarly, one knee and the other knee. They can persist for a very prolonged period of time. And I, I remember the day before we were so effective at treating patients that often some of my patients would actually name their lesions because they were almost like an old friend. Um, not necessarily the best friend. Um, so, um, so, but they can persist a very long per period of time. Most commonly, uh, plaque psoriasis involves the elbows. Uh, we see it on the knees, the lower back, 
um, often around the umbilicus, in the scalp, especially the back of the scalp, the nuchal area, and, and, and on the genitalia, very common locations. Um, Auspitz sign is something uh, that you want to know because this is really often very quite patho um, pathognomonic for psoriasis. And this is um, that if you remove the scale from psoriasis, it causes uh, bleeding to occur right away. And patient, it, it looks like that shouldn't be the case. It looks like sh you should just be able to peel it right off, but that's not the case. And um, this was identified by someone named Dr. Auspitz and bears his name. The Kemner phenomenon is also uh, quite specific for psoriasis. And what this means is that nonspecific trauma can cause the formation of psoriasis in the area where the skin was irritated. So you can just see on this young uh, patient's um, elbow, you could just imagine him just um, drawing his, his fingernail across his elbow on, you know, for an itchy spot, causing that linear form of psoriasis. Similarly, a similar idea where someone could take their fingernail and just drag it down the, the abdomen, causing chemnerization, leading to more psoriasis. Guttate psoriasis, guttate in Latin means dewdrop, and this type of psoriasis presents just like this picture where you have these tiny erythematous papules with very subtle scaling. I think I can point out with my pointer here a little of this scaling, for example, on that lesion, but very subtle, certainly not the prominent scale you see in plaque psoriasis. And this typically uh, develops in people um, in their teenage years or in children. Um, and it is often triggered by a beta hemolytic strep infection. So the most common story is the patient develops a strep, a strep throat, um, is often put on antibiotics like, uh, you know, something in the penicillin family like amoxicillin, um, and then this rash develops. And everybody's thinking this is a rea reaction to the antibiotic, but in fact it's um, the development of their psoriasis. What's interesting here is the course is quite variable. Sometimes uh, guttate psoriasis can resolve completely and never recur. Um, and other times patients will have their guttate psoriasis resolve only a few years later to develop more standard plaque psoriasis. So inverse psoriasis is a type of psoriasis that affects the body folds. And it could be here, like in the, in the intergluteal folds, um, it could be in the armpits, it could be um, you know, anywhere where skin is touching skin, under the breasts. Um, often scale is not visible, but if I biopsy it, I can see that scale under the microscope. Um, sometimes in these locations, the skin can be fissured, and that can be very, very painful. Um, and it also can be secondarily associated with candidiasis. Another type of psoriasis we call pustular psoriasis, and this type has two variants. Um, these start as sterile pustules on an erythematous background. One type of this form of psoriasis involves the palms and soles, um, and the other type involves the entire body. So let's talk about these. The type that involves the palms and soles, again, can be subdivided into two variants. You see the kind that's really just involving the entire palm, we call that palmoplantar psoriasis. Um, and then there's a kind that involves more the distal part of the fingers. You see that here with pustules here involving the distal aspect of the fingers. In this type of pustular psoriasis, um, there's no systemic symptoms. So this is you know, this is something where patients will come in just talking about how the hands or their feet really hurt and, and can be very painful and itchy. Um, and it can be so severe that they will tell you that they can't even open up a jar or they can't walk. So you can see where this is often associated with a lot of disability. Um, but they don't have, for example, fever or chills or other signs of s other systemic symptoms. And this can occur very acutely or it can um, be more chronic. The second type of pustular psoriasis, we sometimes refer to as the von Zumbusch type, occurs very acutely. And here, it's often preceded by those systemic symptoms. So patients will, pre will present with a fever. They'll have uh, 
pustules present on erythematous skin like you can see here in the uh, picture on the left. See these pustules studying this erythematous area. Um, and this often will involve the trunk and extremities. Occasionally we see involvement of the mouth, um, like you can see on the tongue in the picture on the right. Um, and this type of psoriasis, sadly, can actually be associated with cardiovascular and respiratory failure, which ultimately can lead to um, fatalities. So this kind of psoriasis can be very, very, um, you know, treacherous. Um, I think it, it, the, fa the fatalities usually occur as a result of the fact that the skin gets so inflamed that the blood has to um, work double, the, the cardiovascular system has to work double over time to, um, to perfuse the vital organs such as um, the liver and the heart and the brain um, because so much of the blood is um, being sent out to the skin and, um, and a young person might get away with it, but certainly you can imagine somebody who is more elderly who had cardiovascular compromise, um, this can be hugely problematic. Another rare type of uh, um, psoriasis is erythrodermic psoriasis, and you can see here in the picture, the skin gets diffusely red. Looking at this picture, you might say, wow, has this person been burned? And yes, it, it's, it's not that they've been burned, but their skin is just red as if they had been burned. And it can involve large swaths of the uh, body surface area, you know, up to, you know, greater than 90% sometimes. This too can be both acute and chronic. And just like that generalized pustular psoriasis, this also can be associated with fatalities because of um, putting people with compromised hearts or lungs into high output failure. Um, and this is this one, this type is often triggered by either infections or um, medications. So again, happily a rare kind of psoriasis, but very severe kind. Psoriasis also affects the fingernails. About half the time it inv involves the fingernails, 35% um, of the time it involves the toes. So let's just look at some um, different stigmata. Um, it can cause pits in the, uh, on the nail surface. Um, this picture right here uh, shows uh, an uplifting of the nail. Um, we call that um, uh, onycholysis. Uh, maybe over here you get a sense of a slightly uh, yellowish color, and w w when we see that, we call that oil drop spots. Um, sometimes you can get splinter hemorrhages in the nails associated with nail psoriasis, um, and, uh, and just the general crumbling of the nail itself if the entire matrix is involved. So the kind of nail disease and presentation depends on exactly where in the nail the um, abnormality is. For example, in this picture, the abnormality is probably sitting right here underneath the, uh, the nail plate. Um, when we have involvement back here overlying the matrix, then we see um, other kinds of changes such as nail pitting or uh, total uh, nail uh, crumbling and disintegration. So happily, um, psoriasis patients follow the 80-20 rule, which means 80% of them have more limited disease, thankfully, and only 20% have the more severe disease. Um, and we define that as having a greater than 5% body surface area. The body surface area is a number that we calculate roughly based on the size of one's palms, including all five fingers. So if you have one palms, uh, one, one hand's worth, the palm and all the fingers, um, that's 1% of, uh, of your body involved with psoriasis. And, you know, similarly, uh, if you have two hands worth, that's 2%, two, uh, two et cetera, et cetera. So you can see where um, those who have more than five palms worth or 5% body surface area are, um, are those who we call having uh, more severe disease. Um, however, there's, um, it depends on exactly where that involvement is. So for example, 1% on the face, you might agree, is a lot more severe than 1% on somebody's thigh. Um, similarly, 1% on the palms or the soles 
is a lot more impactful than um, than one percent elsewhere. So um, we tend to think of the palms, the soles, the face, the genitalia. They don't follow the same um, body surface area rule because often that limited degree is so severe, both in terms of pain and the disability that it can cause, that it often jumps up in terms of what we qualify as the severity of it. But for the, the more standard kind of psoriasis, you know, involvement of the knees or your elbows or on your back, um, we, we use a cutoff of greater than 5% as defining people with more uh, extensive disease. And that often uh, is very important distinction in who we treat with topical medicines versus who we might advance right away to treating with a systemic kind of approach. Um, there'll be more on that in another uh, little one of these lectures, but it's been my pleasure to, um, to chat with you, and I hope you feel that this has given you a nice introduction into, um, into psoriasis. We've talked a little bit about the pathogenesis. We've talked about the burden for our patients. We've talked about what triggers psoriasis, and we've talked about the five clinical types of psoriasis and how to distinguish them. So I, I hope you found this helpful. Thank you. I'm Katie, I'm 23 years old, and my brother, mother, great-grandmother, grandmother, several uncles, and myself all have psoriasis. Psoriasis in myself changed me because it made me very depressed. Uh, it, it changed how I dressed to cover it up. Um, it strengthened the bond between myself and my husband because he accepted me no matter what. But psoriasis in my son made me angry. <laughs> made me just yearn for more information and a solution and how dare anyone do this to my baby. You know, it's it was very interesting that my daughter was diagnosed as well because all those years I kept saying you know she's she's type A personality I'm like oh maybe maybe she missed that one maybe she missed it but you know it's on my husband's side his grandmother and it's obviously very prevalent on my side and I was like I can't be that lucky and then when she was diagnosed well you know she had that advantage of having the foreknowledge understanding what it was understanding that you know, she's so tough that it's only herself that can, you know, beat her down with an autoimmune disease. There are so many different medications you have to try and fail before you can go to the next level. And for so many people, that just deepens that level of depression because they can't have clearer skin. You know, they're, they're not looking for a perfectly clear skin. They get it. They're psoriatics. They understand. You know, there's a lot of people who on certain biologics can attain, you know, pretty close to clear skin. My son, thank God, is one of them. However, you know, you need to go through this cream slather on, this foam slather on, this one you have to put on a certain way and then cover it with saran wrap for 12 hours and then this oil you have to put in and this one's a short contact cream so you have to put it on and then take it off and make sure you're wearing gloves and it's it's unsettling it's depressing and if you don't have a strong support system you're gonna spiral ever downward you know I was very grateful that you know I knew what this was going into it I could help my kids you know but so many people suffer with this by themselves I'm very excited today to share with you treatment options for psoriasis before I start, I should say that this is an area really ripe with developments and we've had many systemic therapies as well as oral therapies and some topical therapies that have been developed in the past two decades that have really changed the landscape of psoriasis treatments. And I'm going to start with this slide, which talks about the currently available treatment options. As you can see, on the left-hand side, we have a number of topical treatments that are available for patients with typically limited psoriasis. And those I will go into a little bit 
in more detail in the following slides, but overall the categories typically fall into topical corticosteroid therapies versus non-corticosteroid therapies, such as vitamin D analogs, calcineurin inhibitors, um, retinoids, TAR and anthralin are two topical therapies that have been used in the past, but their use currently uh, is quite limited. In the realm of systemic therapies, we typically think of those as having oral therapies versus biologics. In the oral therapy realm, we have oral medications such as acetretin, cyclosporin, methotrexate, and apremolast, and they are ideal for patients who prefer an oral treatment. In the other area of systemic therapies are the biologics, and those are typically injectables or infusions, and they belong to four different classes, and they include TNF inhibitors, IL-12-23 inhibitor, IL-17 inhibitors, or IL-23 inhibitors. One other class of therapy that we oftentimes use in patients with psoriasis include phototherapy, which I will also mention later on. Now, focusing on topical therapies, topical therapies is really the cornerstone of treatment for patients with more limited psoriasis. So what is limited, typically body surface area of 3% to 5% or less. And when we think about topical therapies, the first or the, or the topical therapy that's used most commonly is typically topical corticosteroids. And the reason for that is that topical corticosteroids, when used in limited quantities or in, in the fashion that's limited to the lesions, uh, oftentimes they can be very effective. And there are seven different classes in terms of our topical steroids, and you can really dial up or down the strength of uh, topical steroid depending on the area that you're treating. And in addition to topical steroids, uh, we also have non-steroidal products. And we can start with, for example, there are over-the-counter products that are available, such as salicylic acid, tar, or emollients. Those typically by itself, the over-the-counter products by themselves, uh, typically don't work too effectively on the psoriasis plaques. And most of our patients typically will need at some point a prescription medication. Other prescription non-topical corticosteroid medications include things such as topical calcineurin inhibitors, and those include medications such as tacrolimus or pemacrolimus. We also have topical vitamin D analogs such as calcipotriene or calcitriol that can be very helpful in terms of using them long-term in our patients with psoriasis. And then finally, for patients whose localized psoriasis have really thick plaques, thick scales that's built upon them. Oftentimes topical retinoid such as tazeratine can be helpful in terms of decreasing some of that scale, so breaking down some of that scale. One uh, important area of development in the, in the topical therapy realm in the past have focused on combination therapies. So for example, combining topical steroids with, for example, a topical retinoid agent or combining topical steroids with topical vitamin D analogs. These combination therapies can offer not only convenience, but in certain cases also synergistic effect, uh, essentially more effective when they're used uh, in a combination product versus either product alone or either product used sequentially um, together. Now let's go on to the next modality of treatment, which is phototherapy. Phototherapy can be effective in about 60 to 80% of the patients with plaque psoriasis. And we typically, when we're thinking about phototherapy, there's the targeted treatment, and those include phototherapy devices such as the eczema laser. And those targeted phototherapy devices are really used for patients with limited body surface area. For example, 5% body surface area involvement or less. And I would say the more commonly used type of phototherapy is really the whole body treatment. And that's typically used when there's greater than 5% body surface area involved. The two types of whole body uh, phototherapy treatments that are uh, used include narrowband UVB and Sorolin plus UVA or PUVA. 
Now, while uh, a, de a decade ago, PUVA was the most commonly used modality, these days PUVA is rarely actually used for psoriasis due to its association with skin cancer. So these days, I would say in most facilities, we are using almost exclusively narrow band UVB in terms of total body treatment uh, for patients with psoriasis. Now, phototherapy, as I said, can be quite effective, but the problem with phototherapy for our patients is that it oftentimes requires frequent visits to office. Oftentimes, especially in the beginning, it requires three visits per week. And you typically have to go at least three months to achieve um, clear or almost clear. And then to maintain that level of clearance, you probably still need to go about once a week. So as you can see, it can be quite inconvenient for a lot of patients if they had to travel to a physician's office three times a week. Now, narrowband phototherapy, there are home units as well, uh, but they're still relatively uncommon, and some home units can take up quite a bit of a space in a patient home, so it's not practical for everyone. One downside about phototherapy is that it does not treat psoriatic arthritis or a type of inflammatory arthritis that's associated with about one-third of patients with psoriasis. Okay, we're gonna continue on to talk about oral therapies in psoriasis. And the first oral therapy that I want to talk about is methotrexate. Methotrexate is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, and it can be used and it had been used prior to the advent of biologics as a chronic management for patients without access uh, to, for example, phototherapy, or these days it can be used in patients without access to biologics. It's now, it's not typically prefer these days due to the long-term side effects that limits its use, such as hepatotoxicity, pul pulmonary, as well as bone marrow toxicity. And as you may recall from your pharmacology course, it is also classified formerly as pregnancy category X. So methotrexate, not used as frequently these days. Um, it's mainly used in patients who don't have uh, good access to biologics. Next one is cyclosporin. Cyclosporin, oral cyclosporin, is a calcineurin inhibitor, and it's great in terms of providing immediate relief for really severe psoriasis. The problem with cyclosporin is also long-term use. It's not really a long-term option for our psoriasis patients uh, due to the cumulative effect of nephrotoxicity uh, in these patients. So I would say that cyclosporin is great for a oral medication that's used as a bridging medication, for example, to biologics. The next oral therapy is acetretin. Acetretin targets the retinoid receptors such as um, RXR or RAR in the skin. And it's effective, uh, it's used, it has been mainly studied in palmar plantar psoriasis and it can be effective there. Acetretin overall, when used at 10 milligram doses or 25 milligram per day doses, have modest efficacy. And it has also been associated with uh, long-term use, uh, and in some patients have been associated with elevations in LFTs as well as lipids. It's very important to remember that acetretin is not to be used in women in childbearing, uh, uh, with child, in childbearing age range. And it is also pregnancy category X. A premolast is one of the newer um, oral therapies that was approved a few years back and is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. It treats both psoriasis as well as psoriatic arthritis. It's generally well tolerated except for diarrhea in some patients in the beginning of the therapy. Um, a premolast has, been, uh, has really gained popularity in terms of oral therapies for psoriasis. Uh, the one thing is that it does have modest efficacy, so if uh, you have a patient who will have more severe psoriasis, a premolast may not be the best option. Now I'm going to talk about biologics, which is probably the area with the most developments uh, in the past two decades. In fact, at the time of this particular talk that I'm giving to you now, there are 11 FDA-approved biologics for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. So as you can see, this area is extremely exciting. There's a lot of innovation, and it really has transformed the way by which we treat our patients with psoriasis. 
I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, these as an overview. So for example, what we see here, the first four that's listed, infliximab, adalimumab, etanercept, and sertralizumab, those are all TNF inhibitors. And as a class, uh, with the exception of infliximab, which is given as an intravenous drug, the rest of the TNF uh, medications, the biologics, uh, are given subcutaneously. All of the TNF uh, inhibitors are approved for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and sertralizumab, because it does not cross the placenta, um, it, is also, it can also be used as, uh, as a, a biologic of choice during pregnancy and during breastfeeding. Eustachinumab is our sole IL-12-23 inhibitor. Inhibits both IL-12 as well as IL-23. It's conveniently dosed with a maintenance dose of every 12 weeks. Then we have our IL-17 class, our IL-17 inhibitor class, which includes segukinumab, ixekizumab, and brodalumab. While segukinumab and ixekizumab target the IL-17A directly, um, it's a cytokine inhibitor, brodalumab uh, is a receptor uh, inhibitor. And then finally, we have our IL-23 class, which include gazelkumab, tildrakizumab, and rizinkizumab. And our IL-23 class have a good safety record, and, uh, and they're very convenient in that they can be dosed anywhere between every eight weeks or once every 12 weeks for maintenance. So one thing you may be surprised to learn that despite of our various therapies and many exciting uh, developments in the psoriasis treatment realm, what this graph shows is that there's still a ways between what we um, have developed to what patients have access to. So as you can see, the three bars on the left-hand side shows varying degrees of severity uh, of patients and what they're using. And what's most striking is probably is the red part, which is the topical therapy part. So as you can see, topical therapy uh, for um, over a majority of them are on topical therapy alone, even if they have moderate to severe disease. And many of them, the blue portions of these bars um, at the bottom here, are those who are on no therapy. And uh, this bar on the right-hand side showed psoriatic arthritis patients. And as you can see, the vast majority um, are still on either topical no therapy or topical therapy alone, when we know that that population really needs systemic therapy. So this highlights the under-treatment of our patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, when we're deciding what um, therapies we choose for our patients, there are several factors that are involved. Efficacy, safety, and access are important things that we consider when we're looking at drug-related factors. Patient-related factors include their disease severity, um, not only the physical disease severity of, of their psoriasis, but all those, also the psychosocial impact. And, uh, and very importantly, um, their insurance or their out-of-pocket costs are some of the practical cons considerations that we need to account for. And to summarize, psoriasis is a chronic disease that requires lifelong treatment. At this time, no single treatment works for everyone. And while we have many treatment options that are available for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, um, it's important to also note at the current time, there are still gaps in terms of accessing these medications. Switching treatments are common, whether due to efficacy reasons, safety reasons, or changing one's insurance. And combination therapies can oftentimes uh, uh, seem, especially in topical treatment of patients with limited psoriasis. So hopefully you get a taste of the various um, treatment options for psoriasis patients, and I hope that you will get to learn more of those um, as you continue on your medical school journey. Thank you. So when I was 18, I went to college and I, I take school very seriously <laughs> and I stressed myself into having psoriasis. So I started noticing all the flakes on my scalp and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, oh, this is gross, this is dandruff. I immediately knew what it was because it's, it's different. It, it feels different, it looks different and it acts different. Um, than dandruff. So I knew what it was, I knew how to treat it, I went right to my dermatologist and I said, this is my family history, this is what I've noticed, and she said, yep, you've got psoriasis. Hello everyone, my name is Liz Wallace. I'm an assistant professor of dermatology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Aurora, Colorado. 
In this first module, I'm going to be discussing body surface area. Body surface area is the total surface area of the body. In dermatology, we measure the amount of skin surface area affected by a particular skin condition. And in this case, we're going to talk about body surface area estimates in psoriasis. So body surface area is one tool used to estimate skin disease severity in psoriasis. Mild psoriasis can be defined by having less than 3% body surface area involvement, moderate psoriasis as 3 to 10% body surface area involvement, and severe psoriasis as more than 10% body surface area affected by psoriasis. Body surface area is measured in the clinic using the patient's hand. So if you take a look at the patient's hand, and this includes the palm and all five digits, and you have them scrunch them together as you see in this photo, this is equivalent to about 1% of their body surface area. So on these two representations of psoriasis patients, we can see that on the left side, this patient has confluent or coalescing areas affected by their plaque psoriasis. So one hand can fit nicely within these large plaques of psoriasis. On the right side, we see this patient has a type of psoriasis called guttate psoriasis. And so when we're measuring body surface area, this might be a little bit more challenging because the spots are more spread out. But just use your imagination, clump all of them together, and then you can estimate the body surface area using the palm of their hands. It's important to include only areas of active psoriasis in your body surface area of estimates, not those areas that have resolved, leaving behind just skin discoloration. And then finally, don't forget to include areas like the scalp or the buttocks, which are commonly affected in psoriasis. So let's go through some practice examples. So in this one, this patient has psoriasis on the back. Remember, we're gonna use their hand to estimate the body surface area affected. And so we can see that there's approximately 3% body surface area affected. We kind of move those plaques that are outside the boxes inside the box and then rearrange those in the box to be about one palm and you get about 3% body surface area involvement. Now in the second case, this patient has psoriasis on the forearms. We use the patient's palm to estimate their body surface area. And see, we can see here on the lower arm, there is about 1% involvement, maybe a little bit less. On the upper arm, there's definitely less than 1% involvement. So this patient has somewhere between 1% and 2% body surface area affected by psoriasis. In this module, I'm going to be discussing treatment adherence in psoriasis. Psoriasis is a chronic immune-mediated disease, and in most cases, it necessitates long-term treatment to maintain disease control. More than half of psoriasis patients have been reported to be dissatisfied with their treatment, and up to 40% of patients do not use their medications as intended. We know that treatment satisfaction is closely tied to adherence and patient preferences for treatment. From the literature, we also know that greater psoriasis disease severity is associated with worse quality of life, with those quality of life factors being things like having self-consciousness and embarrassment from active psoriasis, and then symptoms of pain and itch. We also know that greater disease severity is associated with decreased social functioning, an increased prevalence of depression and anxiety, and also a greater risk for developing psoriatic arthritis. So why do we want to treat psoriasis? We want to ensure patients have relief of symptoms, remove that self-consciousness or embarrassment from disease, and to improve quality of life and decrease the medical and mental health comorbidity risk. Many factors go into the selection of the psoriasis treatment plan. We have disease-related factors, including disease severity, the body areas affected, the type of psoriasis, and patients' comorbid medical conditions, including psoriatic arthritis. Now we also have treatment factors that go into selection of their therapy plan. We want to be sure to consider the safety and efficacy of treatment. We want to make sure we ask patients what they've previously tried and had refractory disease to. 
We also very, very importantly want their buy-in and want to know what their preference for their treatment type is. Do they want a topical treatment or do they want a systemic treatment like an oral medicine or an injectable medicine? Do they have a preference for not being immunosuppressed by their medications? Or would they be willing to accept an immunosuppressive treatment if it meant better control of their disease? And then finally, there are financial factors. Is insurance going to cover the treatment plan that you have recommended? Or are they going to have any high out-of-pocket costs associated with the different treatments? At the end of the day, if you, it doesn't matter if you pick the best, most effective, safest treatment for them. If the patient doesn't follow through on your treatment plan, they're not going to get better disease control. And so now I'm going to talk about an important topic, which is how providers can help ensure patients adhere to their medication treatment plan. So what's the definition of medication adherence? It's the extent to which patients take their medications as prescribed. And factors for medication adherence include filling the prescriptions, so whether the patient goes to the pharmacy to pick them up, or whether they're using a mail-in pharmacy and receive them at their doorstep, we want patients to adhere to the frequency, the recommended frequency and timing of a medication administration. We want them to use all their recommended medications, not pick and choose one or the other. And then we also want to continue, have them continue using their medications for the recommended duration of time. So patients may, for medication adherence, be intentional about not adhering, such as deliberately stopping because of side effects or perceived inefficacy, or they may unintentionally um, have medication non-adherence, such as misunderstanding the treatment plan or just being forgetful. And so here in these two columns, we have common barriers to medication adherence. And these are from surveys of patients who were on topical, um, oral, or phototherapy medications. And so they reported that being busy and being fed up were some of the top two medications for non-adherence, inadequate knowledge of disease, familial problems, forgetfulness, and financial barriers to adherence in one study. In another study, patients reported that they were not adherent because they only used it when they needed it, they were forgetful, it was not convenient, they felt the medication was no longer effective or just not effective at all. For some of the medications, it took too much time to apply, that the topical medications might be too messy, oily, or sticky. And then again, we see this uh, financial barrier that some of the medications were too expensive. So let's go ahead and talk about a few considerations for topical psoriasis treatment adherence. In many cases, we're starting patients on topical medications for their psoriasis treatment. One thing to consider is the body surface area involvement, a topic we've already talked about. If they have a large body surface area involvement, it may be very time consuming to apply the topical medication in all the areas affected. If you have patients who have multiple different body surface areas involved, such as the scalp and then other areas, you may be prescribing two different types of topical treatments and you may be asking them to apply them twice a day. So patients may, be, may perceive that using multiple medications multiple times a day could be inconvenient. And so potentially condensing those medications or finding you know, one or a few medications that will best control their disease may lead to better adherence. Their topical medications come in many different vehicles, which hopefully you've already learned about. Ointments are one vehicle, which are like Vaseline, or petroleum jelly. They're greasy and sticky. And if you have a patient who's having to wear professional attire or business clothes, and you're asking them to apply a topical medicine that's greasy or sticky, it might stain their clothes, and they might be less likely to adhere to that treatment. And then finally, the idea of steroid phobia, or that patients hear the idea that they're using a steroid on their skin and they would be fearful of side effects. So in this case, education about the safety and appropriate use of topical steroids would be recommended. So what are some factors that we know are associated with the risk of non-adherence? Many different factors have been looked at in the literature for adherence to medications in psoriasis. The two that have stuck out as the ones consistently associated with a positive or negative risk are satisfaction, and we know that satisfaction, higher satisfaction, is generally correlated with greater treatment adherence. Now in terms of disease and treatment specific factors, 
We know from the literature that adherence generally decreases with increasing disease severity. So what are some strategies to improve medication adherence in your patients? First, the patient-physician relationship is just crucial. You want to have a relationship built upon trust and excellent communication. Next, we want to be sure to educate our patients about their disease and also set expectations for treatment. Take the time to learn about your patients and explore their treatment preferences. Next, be sure to involve the patient in your treatment decisions. And then finally, providing written instructions with their therapy plan is really important. Ensure patients understand the instructions for using medications um, and make the medication regimen as simple as possible. Now for the written instructions, we can write that down on paper. And if I do that, I oftentimes ask patients to take a picture with their phone in case they lose a piece of paper. And now we have patients who have online portals who can have access to their after visit instructions that they can continually reference through the duration of treatment. I've met people in my life who've noticed spots on their skin. And at first, of course, you think, okay, this is a rash. And then when it persists, you think, okay, it's eczema. And then, you know, I've, I've watched certain people go through their own psoriasis journeys where they realize, oh, okay, it's actually psoriasis and here's what that means. And then they realize that it's, you know, a systemic disease and it's more than skin deep. Hello, my name is Wilson Liao, and I am professor of dermatology and director of the Psoriasis and Skin Treatment Center at UCSF. I'm really pleased to be with you today to talk to you about comorbidities of psoriasis. In terms of what we'll be covering today, first, I'd like to highlight that psoriasis, even though it's a skin condition, um, also affects the systemic organs. Second, I will review some of the common comorbidities associated with psoriasis, and these include psoriatic arthritis, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease and other autoimmune diseases, liver and renal disease, as well as mood disorders. And then finally, we'll discuss how optimal care of psoriasis patients involves discussing those comorbidities with them and ensuring appropriate screening and referral. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. One of the most common and important comorbidities of psoriasis is psoriatic arthritis, or PSA. PSA is a chronic inflammatory disease affecting the joints and theses and spine and is characterized by symptoms of fatigue, stiffness, pain, and swelling. PSA occurs in up to a third of patients with psoriasis over the course of their lifetime while individual studies estimate a range of 6 to 42%. PSA usually occurs after the onset of psoriasis or during the onset of psoriasis, and that's true in about 85% of PSA cases. It's important to note that a delay in diagnosis of PSA as short as six months can lead to irreversible joint damage. Risk factors for developing PSA include obesity, psoriatic nail disease, inverse or scalp psoriasis, severe psoriasis, as well as certain genetic risk factors and a strong family history of PSA. Over the past decade, one of the most important comorbidities identified for psoriasis is cardiovascular disease. Uh, in individual associations include myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular mortality. And you can see for each of these three conditions that patients with severe psoriasis have a higher association with these conditions compared to those with mild psoriasis. It's also important to note that psoriasis is associated with cardiovascular disease even after adjusting for the traditional independent risk factors such as BMI, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. And in fact, one study showed that the Framingham risk score, or a person's 10-year risk of developing cardiovascular events, is actually increased by 6% just with psoriasis being present. Another important comorbidity is metabolic syndrome. 
And this includes associations with obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. Just as with cardiovascular disease, the magnitude of association increases with increasing psoriasis severity. Now in terms of directionality, it's been shown through recent genetic studies that obesity is actually causal for psoriasis. And interestingly, both weight loss or gastric bypass surgery can greatly help psoriasis. Another important comorbidity is inflammatory bowel disease. And this includes both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And as you can see here, there's a little bit of a closer association of psoriasis with Crohn's disease. Now, in terms of why inflammatory bowel disease co-occurs with psoriasis, it's been discovered through genetic studies that psoriasis and IBD share at least 11 genetic loci. Now, besides IBD, patients with psoriasis are also at increased risk of other autoimmune conditions. And this includes uveitis, rheumatoid arthritis, alopecia areata, celiac disease, systemic sclerosis, Sjogren's, vitiligo, and primary biliary cirrhosis. Over the recent years, it's been identified that patients with psoriasis also have increased rates of certain liver and kidney diseases. A number of studies have identified increased prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And moderate to severe psoriasis may also be an independent risk factor for both chronic kidney disease as well as end-stage renal disease. Now, psoriasis is extremely burdensome physically and mentally, and this can lead to an increased prevalence of mood disorders. And this includes associations with depression, anxiety, and even suicidal ideation. Compounding this problem, patients with psoriasis also have diminished sleep quantity and quality, as well as an increased prevalence of sleep apnea. So how should we approach comorbidity screening and management for, for psoriasis patients? Well, for psoriatic arthritis, it's really important to inform patients of this risk and ask about symptoms such as peripheral joint pain, neck pain, back pain, and heel pain, and to even consider using screening tools such as the PEST questionnaire. If any of these symptoms are positive, referral to rheumatology may be warranted. In terms of cardiovascular disease, it's also important to educate and inform patients of these risks and to work with the patient's primary care provider to evaluate for hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, and to treat these as appropriate. It's also important to counsel patients on the importance of a healthy lifestyle, including diet, weight, and exercise. For inflammatory bowel disease, again, informing and educating patients in eliciting symptoms such as diarrhea or bloody stools and referral to primary care or gastroenterology if warranted. For liver and kidney disease, it's not currently recommended to do asymptomatic laboratory screening. However, if elevated laboratory values are noted, then follow-up with primary care is also a good idea. And then finally, it's always good to take time during the clinic visit to discuss mood disorders. It's good to elicit symptoms and even consider screening for depression and anxiety using questionnaires and of course refer to the appropriate specialist. So today we've covered a lot of comorbidities in psoriasis. Um, it's a very, uh, it's an emerging topic of great importance and I hope you learned a little bit today. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day. My little brother Thomas, whenever he would go to school, he would tell kids immediately what was on his skin. He, he wasn't shy about it. He would say, I have psoriasis and it's not contagious, you know, and he would let all the kids know what it was and, you know, just inform them. And I think that the most important part of our psoriatic journey is having that information and, and being armed with that so that you can go forward knowing what you have and not being ashamed of it. I'm Joe Marola. I'm a dermatologist and rheumatologist here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. So I'm delighted to be sharing with you some clinical considerations 
about psoriatic arthritis. And I think the first stop on the clinical considerations discussion is one of uh, heterogeneity of disease. And psoriatic disease um, involves at least what we call six different domains of disease. So certainly there is the skin compartment of disease or psoriatic plaque disease that can involve a number of different uh, parts of the skin. There's the potential for nail disease. But in the psoriatic arthritis space, there's the uh, potential for peripheral arthritis, axial disease involving the spine or sacroiliac joints, enthesitis or inflammation at the site of tendon or ligament insertion into bone, as well as dactylitis or the so-called sausage digit or swollen digit. And we'll look at all of those uh, over the next few slides. Psoriatic arthritis may unfortunately remain underdiagnosed uh, in the United States and, and, uh, and throughout the world. In fact, this was a study that showed that upwards of 41% of our patients with psoriasis had undiagnosed psoriatic arthritis, suggesting that we need to do a better job of screening and diagnosing this uh, condition among our at-risk patients, namely those with psoriasis. And the reason it matters to get patients to a diagnosis and to a timely diagnosis is that it turns out there's often um, a delay in diagnosis, and when there's a de delay in diagnosis, in fact, it may have worse outcomes for patients. So you can see here that a delay as short as six months led to increased erosions in the bone, uh, as well as deformed joints and functional disability. So getting patients to a timely diagnosis is uh, crucially important. So what are some of the features of psoriasis that develop that put our patients um, at higher risk for developing psoriatic arthritis. Interestingly, there are a few different phenotypes or features of disease that may increase that risk. For example, the presence of scalp psoriasis, inverse or intertriginous psoriasis involving body fold areas such as the umbilicus shown here, axilla, intergluteal cleft, um, uh, groin folds, and other body fold areas. Nail psoriasis has been associated with increased risk of the development of psoriatic arthritis. Having a first degree relative with psoriatic arthritis, such as the one presented in the case, more severe psoriasis, obesity, and some that are not as commonly measured, subclinical musculoskeletal inflammation, for example, that's seen on imaging, and some that are uh, at present research areas, including serum biomarkers that may help predict the development of psoriatic arthritis. <clears throat> so what does psoriatic arthritis look like? So clinically, it presents as joint pain, joint stiffness. If it goes on uh, uh, long enough, it can um, develop uh, into damage and lead to limited mobility, to uh, decreased range of motion of joints, and can deform joints in upwards of around a half of our patients with psoriatic arthritis. And taking a little deeper dive into some of those patterns, so patients can present with a uh, monoarticular or oligoarticular arthritis, um, a typical presentation might be a wrist and an ankle or a knee and an ankle, for example, uh, involved. And that's about half of um, the presentations of peripheral arthritis as shown here. There is a symmetric polyarthritis subtype that looks almost like rheumatoid arthritis involving um, both sides uh, of the uh, equally or symmetrically. There is the distal interphalangeal arthritis that can involve the DIP joints, for example, of the, of the digits. There is fortunately an uncommon arthritis mutilans variant that occurs in less than 5% of cases that can be quite deforming. You can see here, for example, telescoping digits or accordion digits where there's complete destruction of the joint. And here we see a, um, an example of axial involvement with sacroiliac disease uh, on a sacroiliac uh, MRI. <clears throat> So we mentioned earlier enthesitis. So enthesitis is commonly seen in psoriatic arthritis. Um, there are estimates of anywhere from 30 to 50% of our patients uh, with psoriatic arthritis who have this uh, manifestation of disease. This is, can present as recurrent tendonitis um, uh, or uh, recurrent plantar fasciitis. You can see here one of the more specific findings, which is involvement of the Achilles insertion into the calcaneus. We often can't see it. Now here we can see that swelling or bump um, at the insertion, but it's often something we have to elicit through history and physical exam where we actually push on enthesial points to elicit tenderness uh, from a patient. <clears throat> this is an example of dactylitis where we see not just inflammation at the, for example, proximal or distal interphalangeal joint, but also the intervening soft tissue that leads to this fusiform or sausage-like digit. 
This is actually a very uh, specific finding in spondyloarthritis and something that can be seen in psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and related conditions. <clears throat> of course, there's always a differential diagnosis when we're talking about inflammatory arthritis. So we do have to think about, in our differential, osteoarthritis, which would be the very one of the more common causes of a patient presenting with musculoskeletal pain. Um, so, uh, you know, there are a few elements here, for example, very brief stiffness, so stiffness after a period of inactivity of just a few minutes after, for example, waking up in the morning. Um, there may be uh, classic um, Bouchard or Heberden's nodes present. It's typically slowly progressive, and certain joints may be more involved uh, than others. For example, the base of the thumb is almost, uh, it, it, or very, very commonly, osteoarthritis in nature, and certainly this increases with increasing age uh, over time and is, is very common. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is something else to consider. This is typically a symmetric arthritis. Uh, patients may be rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP antibody positive, although not always. Uh, and there may be some radiologic differences that distinguish this from other inflammatory conditions. Crystal diseases should be considered, including gout and pseudogout or CPPD. Um, this may be uh, very acute in onset, but also may be chronic. Um, what is tricky here is that it turns out that crystal disease may be um, uh, more common among patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, so these are not mutually exclusive and need to remain in our differential diagnosis as such. Fibromyalgia or central sensitization and pain syndrome um, can uh, should also be in our differential diagnosis. Um, similarly, these patients uh, may, um, may have other conditions, and there are some estimates that 20% or more of our patients with inflammatory arthritis may have concurrent fibromyalgia. So again, not mutually exclusive. These patients may have more widespread pain involving soft tissue areas outside of just joints and tendon insertion, for example. And depending on where you are in the world, potentially Lyme arthritis and other infectious uh, diseases may be uh, in the differential diagnosis, septic arthritis for monoarticular disease, etc. <clears throat> so psoriatic arthritis remains very much a clinical diagnosis, and that's very important that it really is based largely on history and physical exam. But there is some testing that can be helpful in uh, in considering you know our pretest probability of a patient's having psoriatic arthritis. So inflammatory markers may be helpful. Uh, it, only about 40 or 50% of patients have elevated inflammatory markers, but when they're elevated, they may predict uh, more severe disease. They may predict more erosion or damage, and so there's some prognostic uh, uh, information uh, that is helpful from those uh, tests. Now, it's also important to um, say the inverse, which is that the vast majority of our patients, 50, 60%, have normal inflammatory markers, and that does not rule out having psoriatic arthritis. The presence of rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP antibodies, about 8 to 12 percent of our psoriatic arthritis patients may have a low titer positive antibody, so it does not exclude the diagnosis, but high titers of these might suggest rheumatoid arthritis. And then imaging considerations are important. So um, x-rays, for example, can be helpful. Um, both as a baseline uh, to understand disease over time, but also diagnostically. Although, again, many of our patients have normal x-rays who have uh, inflammatory and psoriatic arthritis, so it does not rule out the diagnosis. There are some findings on x-ray that are classic of disease that I'll show you on the next slide. Um, also, um, sacroiliac joint x-rays can be helpful in diagnosing uh, the uh, involvement of the uh, axial disease um, which could include sacroiliitis, for example, that may be seen uh, on, um, on plain film. I'll show you that as well. And additionally, um, other imaging is increasingly being used. So, for example, musculoskeletal ultrasound is increasingly being used um, in the rheumatology office to help with diagnosis. Uh, MRI is also used um, often uh, both for peripheral arthritis as well as axial arthritis diagnosis. And then, of course, other testing that might be in preparation for a patient's uh, treatment. <clears throat> so what about x-rays? So on the right side, we see a patient with psoriatic arthritis who actually has quite normal appearing x-rays. And it's important to realize or to point out that, in fact, many of our patients with arthritis have normal uh, imaging. On the left-hand side, you see erosions as well as 
uh, what's the, called the classical pencil and cup deformity. Um, that's, a, that's a typical boards question for a classical presentation of psoriatic arthritis. Here we see a modified Ferguson view showing axial um, uh, disease in patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis. I won't go into great detail, but just know that the CASPAR criteria do exist. These are criteria for, um, uh, for clinical trials, and uh, there's probably some utilization in practice for defining psoriatic arthritis among patients with, uh, with psoriasis. So, <clears throat> Uh, in terms of diagnosis of disease, one of the key elements when we're thinking about inflammatory arthritis and psoriatic arthritis um, are some of the features that distinguish inflammatory from non-inflammatory disease. So uh, stiffness after a period of inactivity lasting at least 20, 30 minutes or more suggests potential inflammatory disease. Improvement with activity as opposed to actually worsening with activity or at the end of the day, again, suggests an inflammatory cause um, all the signs of inflammation, redness, warmth, and swelling, of, of course, suggest inflammation. Um, <clears throat> you know, inflammation doesn't come and go on Monday and gone on Tuesday and back on Wednesday, so episodes and flare duration can be helpful in distinguishing in, an inflammatory cause. Uh, concurrent presence of other systemic symptoms may help uh, distinguish, and of course, some of the other features we talked about earlier that might suggest um, a, 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 a higher probability of inflammatory arthritis. A very simple way to remember this is PSA, psoriatic arthritis. Ask about P, pain in the joints. S, stiffness after a period of inactivity that in, improves with activity. If you can remember another S, the sausage digit or dactylitis that we mentioned, and A for axial disease, remember that spine uh, involvement can happen in upwards of a quarter or more of our patients with psoriatic arthritis. There are validated screening tools that exist uh, that can be used and are patient-facing and very easy to use in the clinic. Um, these are useful in patients with psoriasis for screening. If a patient is positive, you should consider the diagnosis for the workup and referral to a rheumatologist as appropriate. And finally, psoriasis skin disease and psoriatic arthritis unfortunately don't exist uh, in a vacuum. Um, there are many other comorbidities that come with psoriatic disease, many of them listed here. Uh, and in fact, the way to best get our patients to appropriate therapy is to get them to the right care and help them build a team. So, you know, to that end, we make sure our patients are plugged in with their primary care doctor and other specialists as appropriate to some of the comorbidities of disease. Thank you for your attention. Psoriasis is so much more than a disease of the skin. Um, there's so many other things that are affected. It's always important to get the whole story. And I, I think that knowing that your dermatologist cares and they're, they're trying their best to, to help you to get the best possible treatment, that really does matter. If you'd like to learn more about psoriatic disease and ways you can become involved in the work of NPF, visit psoriasis.org.